My name is Emma, and I'm a 20-year-old university student living in New York. I grew up in a family that went through its share of changes. My parents got divorced when I was 14, and I've lived with my mom ever since. Things got even tougher last year when my dad, who I was very close to, passed away from cancer. He left me a significant amount of money in his will, but I could only access it when I turned 20. This year, I reached that milestone, and not long after, something pretty unbelievable happened. One afternoon, my stepdad Justin, who is in his mid-30s and has been married to my mom for the last six years, asked to talk to me. Our relationship has always been a bit strained. I try to keep things peaceful, but he's not always been the kindest to me. He started the conversation with a heavy topic. He suggested that I give the money my dad left me to my stepbrother, Michael, to help with his college expenses. According to Justin, Michael needed the money more for his education, and it seemed only fair to him that I help out. I was taken aback by his request. The idea of giving away the money my dad left for me felt wrong. I tried to explain to Justin that this inheritance was something my dad intended for me, and it felt important to keep it for my future. But Justin didn't see my point of view. He insisted that I didn't need the money and that Michael's needs were greater. Despite his pressure, I stood my ground. I calmly explained to Justin that saying no wasn't about disrespect. It was about honoring my dad's wishes and maintaining personal boundaries. Justin got quite upset at my refusal and tried to intimidate me, but I remained firm in my decision. It was a challenging conversation, but it was important for me to speak up for what I felt was right. I stood firm, making it clear that if Justin was upset by my refusal, he might want to reconsider his approach. Justin, remember, you're part of this household too, so let's try to keep things respectful, I suggested but it seemed like a peaceful resolution wasn't in the cards. I ended the conversation there, leaving before he had the chance to respond. Justin's reaction wasn't a shock to me. Given his past behavior, I had a hunch he might try to claim the inheritance money for himself at some point. You might wonder about my mom's role in all of this. Well, that's a complex issue. My mom, for reasons I can't fully understand, always seems to overlook Justin's negative traits. She's deeply in love with him, almost to the point of blindness, and I didn't want to shatter her perception by constantly clashing with Justin. So I've tried to maintain peace for her sake. It's odd, considering I'm one of the youngest in the house, yet often I find myself having to be the most responsible. At the time of this ordeal, my mom, Mary, was out of town, which is why she wasn't around to intervene. Had she been there, she would have been livid. Justin knew he had a window of opportunity with her away, underestimating my resolve in the process. As I walked away from our heated discussion, Justin followed, berating me and labeling me a terrible sister for not wanting to hand over the inheritance to Michael. But it wasn't about not wanting to help, it was about the principle of the matter. Justin and Michael, unfortunately, seem to follow the like father, like son trope, acting more like schemers from a cartoon than family members. Their antics could remind someone of the characters Pinky and the Brain, with their roles in this scenario up for debate. As I tried to leave the argument behind, Justin wasn't done. He insisted I listen and comply with his demands, bringing Michael into the conversation to reinforce his point. Michael sleepily joined in, confused about the details until Justin prompted him about the important reason behind their demand for the money, a supposed business venture that suddenly became about Michael's university tuition. Their story was inconsistent, with Justin scrambling to justify their claim to my inheritance, first mentioning a business, then switching to tuition. It was clear their motives were murky at best, relying on manipulation rather than any real need or right to the money my dad left me. I just woke up, so I'm a bit foggy, Michael mumbled, trying to piece together his story. Right, the university. I've been thinking about going, and I need the money for that. So yeah, I need it. 
His attempt to claim the inheritance for his education was unconvincing at best. I couldn't help but respond with a firm no, prompting a flurry of protests from both him and Justin. Why not Emma? He's clear about what he wants, Justin pressed, insisting the matter was non-negotiable and that they were entitled to the money. We'll just have to see about that. I replied, the air growing thick with tension. Justin's antics were usually limited to harmless pranks, but this new scheme to manipulate me out of my inheritance marked a departure into outright selfishness and immaturity. I decided to hold off on telling my mom for the time being, preferring to handle the situation on my own, especially after uncovering more about their dubious intentions. Emma, stop being childish. It's time to act like an adult and do what's right, Justin lectured, suggesting that the adult thing to do was to hand over my inheritance. His logic was baffling. And what, Justin? The right thing is to give away my inheritance on your say-so? I countered. His plea to keep this from my mom raised my suspicions further. Why shouldn't I tell her? She has every right to know what's happening in her own house. Justin's desperation not to involve my mom, paired with his uncharacteristically stern tone, only fueled my resolve. Something was definitely amiss, particularly with the so-called business venture Michael had mentioned earlier. It was clear they underestimated my awareness of their tactics, and Justin's vehement opposition to me sharing anything with my mom was a red flag. I reached out to my mom at the first opportunity. Hey mom, how's everything with you? I began trying to gauge her mood. I'm all right, dear. What about you? She responded. I hesitated, knowing what I was about to divulge could cause a stir. Not great, mom. Something's up with Justin and Michael Justin in particular. He's been acting really strange. My mom's response was to caution me against overthinking things. Oh, Emma, don't let your imagination get the better of you but it was too late for reassurances. The pieces were too aligned, pointing to something more than just a misunderstanding or paranoia on my part. Understanding my mom's reluctance to believe the unsettling truth about Justin, I pressed on, determined to shed light on the situation. Mom, I get that you have feelings for him, but Justin crossed a line. He didn't just ask for the inheritance money, he demanded it for Michael claiming it was for education purposes. There's something off about this whole thing, and he even became aggressive when I mentioned bringing it up to you. I explained, my resolve hardening despite her skepticism. My mom hesitated, torn by her emotions and the troubling accusations against the man she cared for. I'm struggling to grasp this, Emma. I feel like we need more evidence to make sense of it all. Don't worry, mom. I'll find the proof we need, I assured her, even though she wasn't entirely convinced. The idea that Justin had somehow bewitched her with his manipulations nagged at me, but I knew I needed solid evidence to reveal the true nature of his intentions. Later that night, I found myself scoring the family computer for any clues that could unravel the mystery of Justin's behavior. Fortune seemed to be on my side when I discovered that Justin had carelessly left his email account open. What I found was a revelation. Emails exchanged between Justin and a woman named Martha painted a clear picture of deceit. These messages were far from innocent, hinting strongly at an affair. But it was the content discussing plans for a divorce and a future together, fueled by an influx of money from a dubious business venture that caught my attention. Justin may have been cautious not to detail any illegal activities, but his indiscretion and betrayal were blatant. Armed with this information and determined to uncover more, I decided to approach Michael, hoping he might inadvertently reveal more about their plans. I initiated a casual conversation with him, subtly turning on my phone's recorder to capture our exchange. Hey, Michael, I greeted him feigning cheerfulness. Hello, Emma, he replied, seemingly in a good mood. You seem happy today. Why not? It's a beautiful day, I said, steering the conversation in hopes of discovering more about Justin's schemes and their impact on my family. 
I approached Michael with a sense of curiosity, pretending to consider their request for the inheritance money. I've been thinking a lot about what you and Justin mentioned. I'm actually considering giving you the money for your college, I told him, watching his reaction closely. Really? That's amazing. I'll let him know right away, Michael said, his excitement palpable. Hold on, not so quickly. Before anything happens, I need to confirm something. This money is specifically for your college tuition, correct? I pressed on, trying to gauge his sincerity. Yes, of course, for my college tuition, Michael stuttered a bit, perhaps caught off guard by my questioning. And you're sure about this? What about Martha? Is she serious about it too? I prodded, dropping the name I had discovered in Justin's emails. Martha? Who's Martha? Michael faltered, a clear sign of confusion crossing his face. Oh, she's, uh, a student advisor at the college. He quickly covered up, but it was too late. Unbeknownst to us, Justin had silently entered the room, and his presence was intimidating. I don't appreciate you questioning my son like this, he interjected, his tone stern. I was merely inquiring about the intended use of my inheritance. After all, if I'm considering giving it away, I'd like to know it's for a good reason, I explained, trying to maintain my composure. Justin's retort was sharp. Once you give money away, it's no longer yours to worry about. It's not your business anymore. The audacity of his statement took me aback, especially considering his next threat. You're not just thinking about giving us the money. You will give it to us, or you'll find yourself out of this house. Michael looked as shocked as I felt by his father's escalation. Dad, this isn't what we agreed on, he began, only to be cut off by Justin asserting his authority in a domineering tone, threatening my place in the home if I didn't comply with his demands. Choosing silence as my response, I retreated to my room, all the while recording the entire confrontation. Justin was unaware that his true colors were being captured for posterity. Once safe in my room, I began compiling all the evidence I had against him. It felt like I was a detective in one of those crime shows, piecing together the puzzle. I had audio recordings and email screenshots, all pointing to Justin's deceitful behavior and his affair with Martha. Feeling the weight of my findings, I decided it was time to bring my mom into the loop. Hello, mom, I started, my voice laced with urgency. Hey, sweetheart, how are you? She responded, unaware of the storm brewing. Mom, are you sitting down? I have something important to tell you, and it's not easy, I said, preparing her for the revelations that were to come. Breaking the news to my mom was tough. I started by telling her about the unsettling discoveries I had made. Initially, she found it hard to believe, but when I played the audio recording of my conversation with Justin, her denial began to fade, replaced by a mixture of shock and heartbreak. Why would he do such things? Why be so cruel? She questioned, her voice breaking with every word. It's hard to say, but we're dealing with someone who doesn't have our best interests at heart. I replied gently, trying to be as supportive as I could despite the harsh reality. I hate to say it, but he's not the person we thought he was. Hearing the truth straight from the recording was a turning point for her. This is unacceptable. I can't believe I wasn't here to protect you from them, she said, determination taking over her initial shock. Stay put. I'm coming back immediately, and yes, I've locked my door, I reassured her. My mom's protective instincts kicked in full force. She was ready to confront Justin and ensure he regretted his actions. He's going to realize he picked the wrong family to mess with, she said, a fierce resolve in her voice. When she arrived, it was a moment filled with mixed emotions. We hugged tightly, sharing tears over the betrayal and the tough decisions that lay ahead. Yet, there was also a sense of relief and unity. Together, we spent hours devising a plan, ready to face the ordeal as a team. In the days that followed, Justin was perplexed by my mom's unexpected return and her cold demeanor towards him. He tried to play it off with a veneer of cheerfulness, likely hoping to charm his way out of any suspicions. 
but my mom was unmoved. She saw right through his act and was gearing up to take decisive action. Concerned about the true nature of Justin's business and the potential misuse of the inheritance, my mom decided it was time to bring in professional help. She hired a private investigator to dig deeper into Justin's activities and the mysterious emails. The thought of him planning to misuse the money for unethical purposes infuriated her further, and she was adamant about protecting us from his deceit. The private investigator's findings confirmed our worst fears and shed new light on Justin's scheming. My mom briefed me on the details, and together, we prepared for the next steps. It was clear that this was more than just a family dispute. It was about standing up against manipulation and ensuring justice was served. In that moment, the atmosphere in the room was charged with tension, a palpable mix of disbelief and resolve hanging between us. Justin's usual confidence seemed to falter under the weight of our accusations, his eyes darting from the camera to my mom, then to me, as if searching for some escape or loophole in our confrontation. You can't possibly understand what you're talking about. This is ridiculous, Justin tried to deflect, but his voice lacked its usual assertiveness. It was clear the tables had turned, and the power he once wielded so effortlessly was slipping through his fingers. Michael, caught in the middle of this familial storm, looked from his father to us, his expression a mix of confusion and realization. Perhaps for the first time, he began to see the man he called father for who he truly was a revelation that seemed to shake him to his core. My mom, with a steely gaze fixed on Justin, stepped forward. Not only do we understand, but we have proof. Emails, recordings. You've been planning to launder money through a laundromat, all the while involving yourself with a known criminal. Martha's record speaks volumes, and your plans for this business are clear as day. Justin's attempts to maintain any semblance of innocence were crumbling fast. You have no idea what you're getting into. This is my business, my life, you can't just barge in, and... But we can, and we are, I interjected, bolstering my mom's stance. This isn't just about your business, Justin. This is about our lives, our safety. You've brought danger and illegality into our home, and we won't stand by and watch you destroy everything for your selfish gains. The evidence was indisputable. The audio recordings of Justin's and Michael's conversations, the emails outlining their plans, and now their caught in the act admissions made it impossible for Justin to deny any longer. The camera in my hands, still rolling, captured every word, every denial, and every excuse, ensuring there was no way out for him. You think you're clever, recording this, gathering evidence? Justin sneered, his composure cracking further. You may think you've won, but... We don't think we've won, Justin. We know we have, my mom cut him off, her voice firm and unwavering. What you've done is not only morally reprehensible but illegal. You've endangered this family, exploited my trust, and now you're going to face the consequences of your actions. As the confrontation reached its climax, Michael finally spoke up, his voice barely above a whisper, Dad, how could you? It was a question loaded with betrayal and disillusionment, aimed at the man he had looked up to. The room fell silent for a moment the gravity of the situation settling in. Justin, now devoid of his usual bravado, seemed to shrink before us. It was clear the game was over. My mom's next steps were clear legal action, separation, and ensuring the safety and security of our family. As we left Justin to contemplate the ruin of his own making, my mom and I knew the road ahead would be difficult. But with the truth on our side and the evidence in hand, we were ready to face whatever came next, together. The veil had indeed been lifted, and in its place, a newfound strength and unity emerged between us, ready to rebuild and move forward from the shadows of deceit. I'm clueless about what you're hinting at. Why don't we call Martha? Maybe she can shed some light on this, huh? Justin tried to deflect, with a tone that barely masked his panic. You two think you've got it all figured out. Martha is just a friend, he added, 
but the confidence he attempted to project was waning rapidly. The compromising pictures we found tell a different story, I countered, my voice steady despite the tumult of emotions inside me. And seriously, who uses email for affairs these days? It's absurdly reckless. Justin, now visibly flustered, shot back, you went through my personal stuff, that's outrageous. No, Justin, what's outrageous is you, my mom interjected, her voice rising in indignation. How dare you repeatedly threaten my daughter over money that rightfully belongs to her? How dare you use threats to attempt to evict her from her own home? Your actions are indefensible. How dare you involve your son in your reckless plans, putting him at risk? And your audacity to plan using that money for illegal ventures is beyond forgiveness. Now, when it's time to account for your actions, you suddenly fall silent? She continued, her words cutting through the air like a blade. Justin, cornered and desperate, spat out, get that camera out of my face, as he lunged towards me in a blind rage. I dodged his attempt swiftly, his aggressive move only adding to the gravity of his unraveling. You're thinking of attacking my daughter now? Do you have any idea how much trouble you're in? My mom exclaimed, her tone a mix of disbelief and anger. Justin, defiant to the end, sneered, you think you understand the situation? You know nothing. Well, let's see if the police agree with you. They should be arriving any minute now, I declared, watching closely for his reaction. Police, you wouldn't dare, he blustered, but his bravado was crumbling. As the sound of police sirens grew closer, Justin's usual smugness disappeared, replaced by a look of sheer terror. It was the first time I'd seen him stripped of his arrogance, revealing the coward beneath. Please, Mary, let's not escalate this. I can explain, he pleaded, his voice cracking under the strain. Save your explanations for the judge, you despicable man, my mom retorted with a disgust that left no room for ambiguity. And Michael, don't think you're absolved from responsibility. You're both going to face the consequences of your actions. As the police arrived, it was clear that this was the beginning of the end for Justin's schemes. My mom's fierce declaration echoed in the air, marking a pivotal moment of justice for us. This should teach you a lesson about disrespecting my daughter and me. You're not too young to understand the difference between right and wrong, and it's time for you to face the consequences, my mom asserted, her tone firm but fair. Yes, mom, I understand. I replied, knowing that I had crossed a line and needed to accept the repercussions of my actions. Come on, Grace, don't you think this is all a bit too extreme? Justin tried to argue, seeking some leniency. Quite the opposite. This is barely scratching the surface of what's deserved, my mom countered, her resolve unwavering. Emma, how's our live stream doing? My mom inquired a modern twist to ensuring that justice was seen to be done. We've got over 5,000 viewers tuning in. This is making waves, I informed her, amazed at the digital audience we had attracted. And just to make things perfectly clear, my mom turned towards Justin, her voice steady and clear, I want a divorce. Yes, you heard it right, folks, she announced, making sure the live stream caught every word. The fallout from the live stream was monumental. The drama unfolded in real time for over 5,000 witnesses, and the story quickly spread to local newspapers and tabloids. Being at the center of this whirlwind was surreal, witnessing the swift downfall of Justin, my soon-to-be ex-stepfather, and the complicit Michael. The satisfaction of seeing justice served was palpable. Justin's world unraveled as he lost his job, friends, and even the support of some family members who chose to distance themselves. Facing serious charges, Justin's future hung in the balance, with the potential of spending up to 22 years behind bars if the court found him guilty. Meanwhile, Martha, his partner in crime, was also discovered by the police after attempting to lay low during the scandal. She too faced similar charges, her future uncertain. Through the turmoil, my mom and I found strength in each other. Our bond deepened as we navigated through the chaos, 
coming out stronger on the other side. Weekends were now our time to unwind on the patio, drinks in hand, reflecting on the absurdity and malevolence of Justin's actions. It was a period of healing and reaffirmation for us both. Good riddance, we toast, a shared sentiment of relief and closure. Good riddance, indeed. First story. They beat brother crashed my car, and my entitled parents lied to protect him. I have an older brother, John, who has always treated me badly. We're just a year apart, but he used to beat me up as kids and always acted like everything I owned belonged to him, too. He was the golden child in the family, which made my life hard. So I moved out as soon as I turned 19. My uncle, who was a retired police officer, took me in when I left home. He even gave me an old Crown Victoria, which I absolutely loved. For some reason, John hated that I had that car. He went through four old cars that eventually broke down, while my Crown Vic kept running smoothly. After his fourth car broke down when he crashed it into a pole, he asked to borrow my car. I had a bad feeling and told him no. He called me entitled and said he needed the car to get to work. I told him to take the bus because I knew how he drives and there was no way I was letting him use my car. My parents called me after that, trying to convince me to lend him the car. I refused, no matter what they said, because I needed it for my own transportation. John wasn't the only one with a job to get to. My uncle was proud of me for standing up to them and even gave me a high five. A few days later after work, I noticed my car was missing from where I had parked it. I called John, but he didn't answer. Then I called my parents and asked if he had taken my car. They denied it at first, but when I said I was calling the cops, they admitted that John had taken it because he needed it. I told him he'd better bring it back immediately, or I'd get the police involved. They called me a jerk, but they also called John and told him to return my car. He showed up in the parking lot 30 minutes later. When I demanded to know how he stole my car, he held up a set of police Crown Vic keys he had bought online. Some of them were made to work with multiple cars. I told him that if he ever stole my car again, I'd have him arrested. Then he had the nerve to ask for a ride home. I reminded him that he left me waiting in the cold after stealing my car so he could walk home. He called me a jerk as I drove away. After that, my uncle installed a tracking device in my car. When Christmas came around, I was celebrating with my family like every year. The roads were cold and icy, so I had to be very careful while driving. By now, you might have guessed from the title, yes, John borrowed my car again during the Christmas party. He decided to pick up a friend and thought I wouldn't notice. But I did when I looked out the front window and saw my car was gone. I pulled up the tracking app and saw he was a few miles away. I called him to yell at him, and everyone at the party noticed something was wrong. I told them John stole my car again, and my uncle confirmed it wasn't the first time. John told me to screw off and said he'd be back soon. I warned him not to drink and drive, but he just hung up on me. While I was watching the tracker, the dot stopped moving. Then we got a panicked call from John asking for help. He had crashed my car because he couldn't handle the icy roads and wasn't used to driving a rear-wheel drive vehicle. We all piled into my parents' minivan and followed the tracker to find him. We found John by the road with my Crown Vic nose deep in a snow-fiddled ditch. My uncle was furious since the car used to be a police vehicle, and I was beyond angry with John for stealing my car again. My parents wanted me to let it go, but I said enough was enough and that I was going to call the police. John begged me not to because he had been drinking before driving and would get a DUI. I told him he was going to pay for the damage to my car, or I'd sue him. As luck would have it, the police were already on their way to check on the accident because someone else had called them. My parents tried to tell the cops that I was the one driving, and they were just there to help me. I told the cops that wasn't true, and my uncle backed me up. One of the officers recognized my uncle, and they had a quick chat. Then the police asked John for his license, and that's when I found out his license was suspended because of his last car crash. They also gave him a breathalyzer test. John ended up in handcuffs while my mom cried and begged the police not to take him away. The officer told her that she and my dad could be arrested too for lying to the police. That shut them up fast, and we all got back in the minivan. The Christmas party ended early and my parents drove me and my uncle home since he had come with me. 
They didn't say much during the drive and sped off as soon as we got out of their van. They almost slid off the road themselves doing that. My brother was released from jail the next day, looking terrified and close to tears. The cops had scared him by talking about the horrors of prison, and he even wet himself. They let him take a shower afterward. My uncle started laughing and told us that his friends at the police department didn't file the DUI charge, just the one for the suspended license, which was about a $1,000 fine. My uncle said he just wanted to teach John a lesson and that this would be the only time to help him out. John then apologized to me and promised to pay for the repairs to my Crown Vic. He also swore he'd never touch my car again. When the car was pulled out of the ditch, the front end damage was minor just a new bumper, headlight, and grill were needed. The damage was only on the surface, thankfully. My parents have pretty much pretended the whole thing never happened. John gave me the extra Crown Vic keys he had bought online and said he learned a lesson he wouldn't forget. Update. This is an update from yesterday. My brother kept his promise and paid for the damage to my car. The body shop guy gave me a fair deal to replace the damaged parts on my Crown Vic and just asked if I cared whether the parts were original or not. I told the body shop I didn't care if the parts were original since the car is old and I didn't want the repair bill to get too high. I thought the damage was just on the surface, but there was a bit more to fix. The shop said they needed to straighten out some minor damage, but it wasn't anything major. They could handle it easily. There was also a little damage to the fender panels, but they assured me it was easy to fix, especially since I didn't mind if everything wasn't perfect. The new parts would be painted to match the car, so that was good news. My brother paid the body shop in cash right away after getting the repair quote. He seemed eager to hand over the money and said goodbye politely. I won't say how much it cost, but it definitely hurt his savings, especially after paying the fine for driving without a license. He was hoping to get a new car, but now he can't until his license suspension is over, which I think will be a while. My parents had given my brother a ride to the body shop, and after he left, they stayed behind to scold me for making him spend all his money fixing my car. I could tell they were about to say something about how I should have just let him use my car in the first place, and how this all could have been avoided if I had. But something inside me snapped, and I cut them off. I finally let it all out. I called them out on everything the favoritism, how they've always treated my brother as more important than me. I reminded them that I had to move in with my uncle just to get away from their unfair treatment. I told them how they let my brother steal my car and then tried to lie about it until I threatened to call the police. They even tried to lie to the police by saying I was the one driving when my brother crashed my Crown Vic. And now they were mad at me for making my brother pay for the damage he caused by stealing my car on Christmas Eve, driving without a license and while drunk. By the time I finished, I was out of breath. I was nearly out of breath. My mother was crying and my father's face was bright red, looking like he was about to explode. But instead of shouting, he took my mother by the hand and started to leave. Just then, a guy sitting near the door blurted out, You guys are narcissists. That was all it took to push my father over the edge. He started attacking the guy like a madman. My dad isn't small, and he knows how to throw a punch. So he beat the poor guy badly like a wild gorilla. I yelled for the clerk to call the cops, and they did. When my father heard that, he bolted out the door and drove off, leaving my mother crying in the lobby. The police had to pick him up at home, and surprisingly, he cooperated when they arrested him. But now he's facing charges for assault. The guy my father beat up had a badly swollen black eye, a possibly broken nose, and a concussion. I was there when they put him in the ambulance to take him to the hospital. My mother has been calling me, crying and blaming herself. My uncle says it's about time my dad got some karma, and my brother is doing everything he can to stay out of it. This is not how I thought things would turn out. Update. My father is out of jail now, and I've been told he looks terrible. My mother paid his bail and when he came out, he looked almost as beat up as the guy he attacked. Apparently, he picked a fight in jail over the weekend and got jumped by other inmates. My uncle went with my mother when my father was released and described what he looked like to me. He said, my dad has two black eyes, dark bruises all over, a fat lip, and is missing a tooth. My uncle said my father didn't try to blame me for anything this time. He barely spoke at all. He just got into the minivan with my mother and went home. 
I managed to get in touch with the guy my father beat up. A friend of a friend knows him. I'll call him Scott for now. My father beat Scott up pretty badly. Scott has a concussion from hitting his head against the wall after being punched several times. His nose is indeed broken, and he's in a neck brace. He spent three days in the hospital. When I asked him what he planned to do, he confirmed that he's going to sue my father and has already spoken to a lawyer. I told him to do what he needed to do, but I don't have any more details about the case. My friends and I put together a gift basket for Scott, and we all chipped in some money since he won't be able to work for a while. Even my uncle contributed, even though he didn't have to. Scott was very thankful when we gave it to him. My mother hasn't tried to call or text me since my father was released, but my brother texted me that she's still been crying a bit, and my father has been mostly silent since he got home, hardly leaving the couch. The last time my father was like this, he didn't speak to anyone for at least a week, but this situation is much worse than what made him go silent last time. Final update. I know it's been months, but I finally have an update. The guy my father beat up is doing fine now, though he still needs to get his nose fixed. The rest of his injuries have healed well. He filed a lawsuit against my parents, and at first, my father was determined to fight it, but he eventually changed his mind. Why? Well, for a few reasons. First, someone broke several windows on my parents' minivan in the middle of the night. My uncle said the police think it was done with a BB gun, but they couldn't find out who did it. My father replaced the windows himself, as he's done that before, and there hasn't been any more vandalism since. I think whoever did it might be connected to the guy my father beat up. Second, a lawyer told my father that he had no chance of winning in court. There was CCTV footage as several witnesses, including me, and no judge would side with him. The last thing that made him change his mind was when my mother threatened to divorce him. That seemed to be enough for him to finally give in. They settled the lawsuit in mediation before it went to court, but I don't know how much my father paid because my mother won't tell me. I'm guessing it was a lot. As part of the agreement, my father also has to go to anger management classes. I've only seen my father a few times in the past few months, and it's clear he's still mad at me. He avoids looking at me and always seems angry. But after everything that happened, he can't justify his anger anymore, not even to himself. He just sits quietly and fumes. He's also cut back on drinking a lot, probably because it's one less expense for him and my mother to worry about. As for my brother, he'll be glad to know he's been trying hard to make things right with me. He moved out of our parents' house and is living with a friend now. He got his license back, but doesn't have a car yet because he can't afford one. Instead, he rides a bike to work. His relationship with our parents is more strained now, though. After a while, our father started blaming him for everything that happened over the holidays, and our mother had to calm him down. My father is a lot calmer now since he started going to anger management but it's clear he still doesn't like me. It's not like my parents are suggesting family therapy or couples therapy. I think my father doesn't want more people telling him he's wrong, and my brother and uncle agree with that. My father is still working, though his clients dropped off for a while. He's back on his feet now. My mother says he wants to get dentures for his missing teeth. It turns out he lost more than one tooth after getting out of jail. Initially, it was just one, but several of his upper teeth were already in bad shape and he had to have more pulled. Now he's missing five teeth on the upper left side of his mouth. A lot of people criticize my uncle for keeping my brother's DUI from being filed and I had mixed feelings about it too. My uncle read many of the comments and finally said, after a few months, that he'd never do something like that again no matter who it is. I agree with him and my brother understands too so no one will ever expect my uncle to just fix things if they get arrested again. So, that's my final update. See you all later. P.S. Yes, my car is doing fine. It has a tracker and a kill switch now, and there have been no mechanical issues since it was repaired. I think this story might be fake because everything seems too convenient, but I'll keep updating as the original poster shares more. Second story. My date husband left our toddler and baby on a busy road, and they almost died so I packed my bags and left. Now he's begging for forgiveness, what should I do? Hey Reddit, I need to share what happened because I'm still shaking. I'm 27 and have been with my husband, who's 32 since 2024. 
We have a five-year-old daughter and a newborn son, but tonight something terrible almost happened. My husband has always had trouble focusing, but I never thought it would go this far. Our neighborhood is laid out strangely, with cars speeding by all the time. I was folding clothes when I suddenly heard our daughter scream, Dad, help. That scream made me drop everything and run outside. What I saw made my heart stop our newborn stroller was rolling toward the busy street. I screamed and ran as fast as I could, barely stopping the stroller in time. My daughter had fallen and scratched her hands and knees while trying to chase after the stroller. I grabbed my baby, my heart racing, and looked around for my husband. He wasn't watching the kids, he was chatting with the neighbors, completely unaware. The anger I felt was like nothing I've ever experienced. I stormed up to him, shouting in disbelief. He looked shocked at first, and then realized what had almost happened. He started apologizing and crying, but it was too late. I couldn't understand how he could be so careless, so blind to our daughter's screams and the stroller rolling away. I packed up the kids and left. I'm staying with my parents now, and they're on my side. But my husband keeps texting and begging for forgiveness, saying it was just an honest mistake. But I can't get over the fear of almost losing my baby because he couldn't focus for even a second. My daughter got hurt because he wasn't paying attention. I almost lost my son because he wasn't paying attention. I can't stop crying. I wish this had never happened. I'm sorry this is short, but I just want to hold my babies. And I can't stop shaking every time I think about it. What if I had been just one second late? Would I have been planning a funeral? I left the house because I hated it. I didn't feel like it was safe for the kids with all the traffic, and I was right. It's my husband's workhouse. And I can't be running around either. I had a C-section less than five weeks ago. A lot of people are asking why I wasn't watching the kids myself. I was doing their laundry like any parent does while my husband took the kids for a walk to spend time with them. He caused this situation all by himself. This has never happened before, so how was I supposed to know? People are asking why I didn't get him checked out. I'm not his mother. He's 32 years old. I'm tired of people acting like I have to parent my husband while I'm also taking care of a newborn and a toddler and still healing from a C-section. I even tore my stitches when I ran to save my baby. I don't care if it was his ADHD. The court wouldn't care either. If he had killed my child, he would have gone to prison, no matter what. Relevant comments and additional information from the OP. A specific comment mentioned, Okay, he was 99% wrong, and I'd be furious just like you, but I'm a little confused about the situation. Why was your baby left unattended in a stroller? How did the stroller end up in the road if you were at home? Is it normal for your baby to be out front in the stroller while your toddler plays outside? Maybe it was a freak accident. As a mom, I have to be honest, most of us have had near-death experiences with our kids. We could be naive and expect our little ones to have more awareness and survival skills than they do. When my son was two, we had a terrible experience with an escalator and I still have trouble sleeping because of it. Every parent has these moments unless they're insanely lucky. I don't fully understand what happened, but it seems like he's really sorry and feels awful. Once you go through something like this, you never forget it. If he truly loves your kids, he's devastated and has learned a hard lesson. I'm not sure if your response was the best, but I understand why you did it in the heat of the moment. I think you two need to have a serious talk and maybe consider moving if possible. I wouldn't jump straight to divorce like Reddit often suggests. I believe there's a solution here, and I'm so sorry you're dealing with this. It's the worst feeling in the world. Alp's response. Hi there, let me clarify. I was sitting inside in the living room, and there's a big window behind the TV that was open a little so I could hear what was happening outside. That's when I heard my toddler scream for her dad to help. When I got outside, he was standing on the neighbor's driveway. I think he must have left the baby on the road because there's no way the stroller would have rolled off by itself. My toddler was playing with the neighbor's cat before she noticed her brother rolling away. When I confronted my husband about it, he just kept stuttering and couldn't explain what happened. I still don't know if he forgot to put the brakes on the stroller, if the wind pushed it, or something else. My neighbor contacted me and asked if I wanted the security footage because his wife is completely on my side. So I'll probably find out what happened once I get the video. Comment. I understand this is a horrible situation, but saying you don't care if it was his ADHD won't help and might make things worse. 
It's important to remember that with ADHD, sometimes people don't register things like this at all. People with ADHD often have shorter life expectancies because they may accidentally harm themselves. This isn't the same as being careless. Learning more about ADHD could help you both stay safer. Understanding how my ADHD works and using specific precautions has probably saved my life. You should tell your husband what you need from him, whether that's getting better control of his ADHD through medication or other methods, or setting clear rules like not taking the kids out front without you. It's strange that neither your husband nor the neighbor noticed the stroller you did from inside. Were the neighbors just watching the stroller roll toward the street? Was your husband somewhere where he couldn't see it? Were you already heading outside when this happened? I'm trying to understand why neither your husband nor the neighbor noticed what you did from inside. People with ADHD usually react quickly in emergencies, so this seems odd. I'm not accusing you of leaving anything out, but think about what your husband and the neighbor were doing that they missed it. Something feels off. This is a terrible situation. I once lost a pet due to inattention from ADHD, but I can't imagine nearly losing a child. Ops response. That's why I'm waiting for the footage. It doesn't make sense how this all happened. I'm not sure how to describe my house. There's a big window in the living room that was open a bit so I could hear outside. The neighbor's house is three houses away and we live at the end of the street near a main road. When you walk into my house, the living room is on the left and the kitchen is on the right. When I got off, I couldn't run fast because I'm still healing. Sorry if this is confusing. When I ran outside, the neighbor's wife was running toward the stroller but was still far away and the neighbor was helping my little girl off the road. That's all I saw. I'm just waiting to hear back from them. My husband was just standing there with his hands on his head, doing nothing. Comment. I was shocked when I read what happened. Are you okay? Did you hurt yourself more? You just had a baby. What was your husband doing? Being outside with small children, especially near a busy street, should be like watching them swim. Anything can happen in an instant. I hope you're okay. Do you have cameras in your house? I wonder how long your husband was talking to the neighbor. Ops response. I tore my C-section stitches and had to go to the ER. While I was there, I made sure my little girl got her knees and hands bandaged up. The crazy thing is, I didn't even realize I was bleeding until I was in my parents' car. My mom noticed and panicked, taking the baby back to their house while my dad took me and my daughter to the hospital. Update 15 hours later. The neighbor's wife sent me the footage, and I just can't believe what I saw. My husband was walking with the stroller, and our toddler was in front of them. When they passed the neighbor's house, the neighbor was outside washing his car, and our toddler saw his cat and stopped to pet it. My husband stopped too, but he left the baby on the road. He didn't even bother locking the stroller wheels and walked all the way up the driveway without looking back. He had his back to the stroller for about 10 minutes before it suddenly started moving. I think it was because the road is on a hill, or maybe it was the wind. My toddler never went near the stroller. The stroller rolled down the road, and that's when my toddler started screaming and running after it. When she saw the stroller, the neighbor started running after my daughter, but she tripped, and he tried to help her up. That's when the neighbor's wife drove into the frame, stopped her car, and ran back toward the stroller. After that, everything went out of frame, but you can hear all the noise. My husband just stood there the whole time with his hand on his head, staring blankly. He didn't even move when our toddler was crying after she hurt herself. He only started crying when I confronted him. I don't know what to do. I'm panicking because this isn't the life I wanted for my kids. I can't understand why he just stood there. I haven't gotten a text or call from him since I saw the video just silence. I can't stop hearing my daughter's screams in my head. It's a sound no mother ever wants to hear. I can't explain it, but it felt like my blood ran cold, and all I felt was pure fear. I'd never want to watch that footage again. Thank you for watching the video. If you're interested in more stories like this, we have plenty more to share. Just subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.